All right, let's go ahead and get started. I do want to welcome you to this seventh installment of Unit 0. This is Safety, Nature of Science, and Measurement. We're approaching the end of the unit, so it's a good time now to be thinking about some challenge questions. And so we're going to use this opportunity as, an, as a way of, of uh, kind of challenging ourselves and making sure that we know uh, the material that we've been covering for, these last, uh, for this last unit. So first question would be this. What types of information might be found on an MSDS sheet? So you really need to have an MSDS sheet in front of you to uh, be able to answer this question. It really doesn't make any difference what the chemical is. I have one here for acetone. And uh, when I look at that, that uh, MSDS sheet, and again, just download one off the Internet. It doesn't have to be acetone. It can be anything. Uh, but uh, what are you going to find on an MSDS sheet or material, sa material safety data sheet? You'll find things like other or generic names. For example, acetone can also be called 2-propotone, beta-ketopropanone, dimethylformaldehyde, dimethylketone, methylketone, propanone, uh, pyroacetic ester. So all these are other names, and you'll certainly find those on material safety data sheet. Also, the manufacturer and distributor. Uh, an emergency number to call 24 hours a day, 7 days a week in the event of an emergency. You'll find uh, health hazard uh, information. Uh, and what to do in case of, an, uh, of, a, a, of a spill. You'll find first aid information and so forth. So that's the type of information you're going to find on an MSDS sheet. Let's talk about what you're not going to find on an MSDS sheet. You're not going to find the cost of the chemical, so you, how much you paid for the chemical. That certainly it would be on an inventory list, but it wouldn't be on the MSDS sheet directly, so not cost. Nor the delivery date. So if you wanted to look at the MSDS sheet to tell you when it was actually delivered to your business or school or whatever it might be, the delivery date would not be on the MSDS sheet. Okay? All right. That's number one. Let's look at number two then. Number two says, sketch an NFPA symbol for a substance which is a serious health hazard but not particularly flammable. This substance has no general reactivity issues, but under no circumstances should it be mixed with water. So this is a very rough sketch that I've made. Uh, but uh, I think it, it, uh, it, it delivers the general idea here, and that is that you're going to see in the upper part of the diamond, the red part, that's flammability. So they, they, it says in the problem that it's not particularly flammable. However, I'll, I'll just give it a score of one, just because it's, it's, uh, there's going to be flammability issues with just about everything except something like water, for example, but no particular flammability issue, so I'll just put a one. However, it says that, that there is a, a health issue. It is a, a serious health hazard. I gave it. I could have given it a three or a four. I gave it a three in this blue diamond right here on the left left hand side. On the right hand side, it's yellow. That's general reactivity. But they tell me that there's no general reactivity issues at all. So I just gave it a zero. I could remember it go zero to four. But they tell me under no circumstances should it be mixed with water. So I put this symbol a W with a line through it means no no uh, mixture with water. And so there it is. There's my general reactivity, uh, excuse me, there's my NFPA symbol for uh, this particular substance. All right. Let's go on to number three. Number three says, in the event of a laboratory accident, what should, when should a fire blanket be used instead of a safety shower? Well, fire blankets are for fire, all right, obviously. And if somebody is, uh, is, is it looks like, the, I mean, it's going to be very serious. Now, if it's just their sleeve or something like that, you're probably better off just with your hands, just grabbing the, the sleeve and just putting out with your hands very quickly. But uh, if, if the individual uh, is, is and, and hopefully this will never happen, but if it does happen uh, that an individual is clearly uh, going to be in trouble, uh, then, then you're going to need to use that fire blanket. You're going to wrap, wrap them up in the fire blanket. Be aware that air will seek the open areas, which is, by the way, their feet and their head. So you want to make sure that that fire is doused out, that that fire is put out in those areas, particularly in the head area, because you don't want flames near their, their nasal passages or their mouth, because uh, that can be just as deadly as the fire, as the burning skin. So um, absolutely use the fire blanket in that event. The safety shower is used for a chemical spill, and, it, and it's generally going to be a, a significant spill. In other words, if somebody's just dropped a, a bit of uh, acetone on their finger, that can just be you know, rinsed off in the sink. But if it's a major spill, hydrochloric acid, for example, uh, falls over somebody in their entire uh, body, it's time to get in, into the safety shower. And uh, that's what the, the, the difference is between those two uh, safety instruments.
So that's number three. Number four, it says in the laboratory when working with chemicals such as acetone, which is highly flammable, what is the most important thing to keep in mind? Folks, when you're dealing with flammable materials like acetone, for example, you sh there should be no open flames in the room. That's critical. No open flames in the room. Just the fumes alone can ignite and cause a disaster. So there are other ways of heating things up uh, in the laboratory without using an open flame, and I'll show you how to do those uh, techniques. Uh, you can use, uh, you can use uh, hot plates and so forth, but no open flames in the room when, when you're using highly flammable materials. All right, number five, and we are just skipping around here, but that's the point, right? We want to make sure that we understand all the material uh, and are ready for our examination. Number five says convert 84.2 liters to milliliters. Here's the technique that we're going to use. We're going to start with what we know. We've got 84.20 liters. Notice that there's four significant digits here, right? That the eight, the four, the two, obviously non-zero digits, but the zero is significant because there's a decimal somewhere in the, in the number. We, liters on top, liters on bottom. So remember, liters and liters are going to cancel away, and we're going to be left with milliliters on top. There's a thousand milliliters in a liter. So we multiply across, I get this number, 84200 milliliters, right? Now, let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about significant digits. The thousand doesn't affect the significant digits because there's exactly, exactly a thousand milliliters per liter. In other words, a thousand milliliters per liter. The thousand is, in, is virtually has an infinite number of significant digits because it's an exact number. There's an exactly, by definition, a thousand milliliters in a, li, in a liter. So the, the, the deciding factor is going to be this 84.20. I have four significant digits here, so I have to have four significant digits in my answer. Now look at the dilemma that I face here. I have 84200. If I don't put a, a decimal, if I do not put a decimal here, I would have only three significant digits, the eight, the four, and the two. But if I do put a decimal there, I have one, two, three, four, five significant digits. That's no good either. What's the solution? Well, the solution is use scientific notation. So to convert 84,200 scientific notation, remember the decimal originally would have, would have been there. I'm going to move it over one, two, three, four places to the left. This is a number bigger than one, so I'm going to have a positive exponent on the 10. So we have 8.420. I'll keep one of the zeros, but not both of them, to maintain that four significant digits that I need times 10 to the fourth, and of course the unit is in milliliters. Okay? Good. Let's look at number six. Number six is express 0 0.00482 liters in scientific notation. Okay, here's where the decimal place is right now. I want one and only one number to the left of the decimal. So I'm going to go over one, two, three places to the left. This is a small number. Therefore, the exponent is going to be negative on the 10. So it becomes 4.82 times 10 to the negative three liters expressed in scientific notation. Let's talk a little bit about Significant digits, by the way, leading zeros are never significant. Whether there's a decimal place there or not, they are never significant. So I want three significant digits, 4.82. This number right here, this part of the number doesn't contribute to the significant digit tally. So I have three significant digits here, three significant digits here. I'm in good shape. Let's go to number seven. All right. All right, I like this question. This is from the New York Regents Practice uh, Test. Uh, and it has to do with experimental experimental design. So here we go. Number seven says a student collects data to determine experimentally the density of distilled water. Now, based on this experiment, or based on the experimental data collected, what is the density of the distilled water? So they give me some information, right? They give me some information. They say the mass of the graduated cylinder and the distilled water together is 163.0 grams. Then they tell me that the mass of the empty graduated cylinder is 137.0 grams. So what's the mass of the distilled water? Well, it's the difference, right? Because graduated cylinder plus water minus graduated cylinder must equal to water, right? So when I take the difference, I've done this calculation over here. I get 163.0 minus 137.0. I get 27.0. Now let's talk about subtraction and significant digits involved in subtraction. Remember that I'm going to look for the least precise of these two. In both of these cases, they are to the nearest tenth, right? They are to the nearest tenth. So my answer can be to the nearest tenth. I had 163.0 minus 
minus 137.0. The difference is 26.0. That zero is significant. It matters because I can go to the nearest tenth. So I'll write that number right there, 26.0 grams. So that's the mass. What about the volume? Well, they give me the volume is 25.3 milliliters. When I do this division, I've got 26.0 grams divided by 25.3. Here's what I get on the calculator, 1.027. But now I'm doing a division. And when we do division and multiplication for that matter, but for, for now for division, if I have three significant digits on top and three on the bottom, I take the least of the two. Well, of course, it's three. It's one point, excuse me, it's going to be three significant di digits. So the question is, do I kick this two up again, up or not? So I have 1.027, but do I kick the two up or not? Yes, I do. Why? Because the previous number is five or greater. So that's going to make it 1.03 grams per milliliter. Folks, I will tell you that distilled water has an exact density of 1.00 grams per milliliter. So it's a little bit off, but I'll let you um, determine the percent error uh, for this question, number seven. But for us on this problem, it's close enough right there. 1.03 grams per milliliter is the density of distilled water. All right, let's go to number eight. Number eight says this. It says, a student found the boiling point of a liquid to be 80.4 degrees Celsius. If the liquid's actual boiling point is 80.6 degrees Celsius, what is the experimental or percent error? All right. Well, we have to remember what the formula is for percent error. Percent error is equal to the value accepted minus the value experimental divided by the value accepted. Now, they tell me that the actual value is 80.6, right? So that's the one that goes here and goes down here as well. But it says the experimental value, the one that was determined, is 80.4. So when I take that difference, I get this number. I get actually 0.0025%, but when I multiply it by 100, I get a very small percent error, only 0.25% error, and that'll do it for number eight, okay? Let's look at number nine. Number nine says, how much would the quantity of heat equal to 200 joules be in kilojoules, right? So this is a conversion problem, obviously. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look to see what I've been given. 200 joules, and I'll start with 200 joules and plus that, put, put that number over 1. That holds the place and makes sure that I keep track of where the numerator and the denominator are. I'm going to multiply that by, remember, whatever units in the upper left goes in the lower right. Whatever units I'm looking for goes in the upper right. I'm looking for kilojoules. So there's 1,000 joules and a kilojoule. So here we have zero, 200 divided by 1,000. We can just do that in our head. 0.2 kilojoules okay by the way notice only one significant digit on the two on the 200 there would have been three had i had a decimal after the last zero but i don't so i can only have that many significant digits or one significant digit in my final answer all right remember the thousand doesn't change the significant digits it's exactly a thousand so theoretically there's an infinite number of significant digits here so i don't have to worry about it it's this number right here that's determining the significant digits, not this number, not the 1,000, but the 200, rather, is determining the significant digits. Folks, we'll call it quits on this one. On the next installment, we're going to take a look at a few more problems. I'll see you then. Thanks. Bye-bye.